Hey guys, welcome to Man Medicine, where we talk about how men can optimize their health and escape the collapsing U.S. healthcare system. All right, today we're going to talk about muscle mass and how critically important as you get older it is to not only build muscle tissue, but especially after the age of 60, to hold on to that muscle tissue. And you have to fight tooth and nail to keep it because muscle tissue is precious. It's going to be one of the major determinants of your health. And you may not feel that right now if you're a young strapping 20 year old but let me tell you it's gonna be a huge issue for you when you get into your 70s 80s and hopefully into your 90s if you don't make the steps that you need to do now to start thinking about this in the future so this is uh, this is like one of my most important topics that I push with my my patients and uh, I like to talk about it anytime I can because so much of what I see in the emergency department has some sort of a fundamental uh, relationship to the loss of muscle mass, especially in my, in my elderly patients. So, all right, let's talk about this. So what happens when you get older? I mean, it's not, it's not a tough riddle, right? I mean, as you get older, your muscles get smaller, they get weaker. Uh, your fast twitch muscle fibers, which are the most uh, explosive, they're the ones that are most, uh, you know, responsible for, um, you know, providing torque and muscle strength. Uh, those are the ones that go first and it, it's the loss of those fibers that I mean it has a lot to do with this epidemic of elderly falls you have to have strong fast twitch muscle fibers to if you trip on a rug to be able to plant your other leg out in front of you and have that quadricep muscle quickly contract and keep you from going down to the ground so losing these type 2 muscle fibers is a huge deal um, your muscles don't contract as quickly. The nervous system that, you know, the nerves that innervate your muscles don't work as well. So there, there's, there's a precip precipitous decline in muscle strength, muscle size, muscle function. And I'll say up front that there's a lot of this that is inevitable, right? I mean, it, it's not realistic, even if you do everything perfectly, that your, you know, the circumference, the, the volume of your biceps is going to be the same as it was when you were 20. Okay, and it doesn't matter how much protein you eat or how many, um, you know, cycles of anabolic steroids. The, the aging process, it's going to get us. It's going to get all of us. Okay, but my point is that there's a lot you can do to slow that decline, and not only slow the decline, but it's it, it's going to be critically important for you to build up a reservoir of muscle tissue that, when you inevitably lose it, even if you do everything perfectly, is not going to be. Um, it's not going to be sufficient to impact your quality of life because that's ultimately what this is all about. Um, I don't want to see any of you or any of my patients in a nursing home um, after a medical catastrophe. And unfortunately, in the emergency department, that's all I see all day long is uh, people who suffer some sort of a medical catastrophe and then require hospitalization. And because of their weak muscles, I mean, it's one of the fundamental issues, they can't go home and they end up in a rehabilitation center. And that's a whole nother ball game and uh, not a place that I would wanna send anybody in my family or anybody else for that matter. So, so when I was in, in residency, there was a, a toxicologist that was on our staff and he said, every single case that walks through here, every patient is a toxicology patient. And I kind of like chuckled about that, but sure enough, like he found a way to like find a toxicology angle to, to any of these patients, to every patient that came in. And I was always amazed that he could do that. But what I do with my medical students is I, I can find a muscle strength a sar or slash sarcopenia angle to almost every patient that comes in the emergency department. Um, and, and it's actually, it's a lot easier than it is, than it was for him to find toxicology angles because sometimes it was a bit of a stretch. But the, the things that I see in the emergency department, you know, from sepsis to trauma to uh, especially like elderly falls as part of trauma, I mean, there's almost always a fundamental issue uh, with that patient in terms of muscle strength, and it's uh, it's 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 usually glaringly obvious. This is where we're gonna. This is the paper that I'm gonna review here, and, and most of the information I'm gonna show you in regards to muscle tissue is gonna come from this really good article. Current opinions in clinical nutrition and metabolism care 2004 it's from july muscle tissue changes with aging so it's a really nice review even though it's a little bit old um you know this these changes these aging related changes have we, we've known about this for a really long time and that we've worked out a few additional details but the fundamentals um we've known these for a long time so no matter what your age is there there's always this balance 
within your muscle tissue of muscle breakdown and muscle building, you know, or anabolism versus catab uh, catabolism. And ideally, you want to have the anabolic uh, effects to be uh, superior or predominant over the catabolic effects. But, um, you know, at the very least, you want to be in equilibrium. You don't want to tip that anabolism down and have uh, catabolism to be the predominant feature because that's that's what's going to end up costing you muscle tissue but that is inevitably what happens as you get older and um, and, and even if you do everything right there, there's going to be some component of that but this is something that unfortunately especially if you're just if you just do what the average american does you're going to be burning through muscle tissue at an accelerated rate as i said there there is a inevitable decline but one of the major reasons that older people start losing muscle tissue is they start developing these comorbid conditions that like greatly accelerate the process and this can be type 2 diabetes which um, you know because of its lipotoxicity uh, I have another video on that if you want to know about lipotoxicity um, visceral body fat the, uh, the pro-inflammatory nature of visceral body fat the way that it infiltrates muscle tissue um, is directly toxic to muscle tissue. It, it greatly accelerates the, the catabolism of muscle tissue, um, chronic kidney disease. COPD is a big one. People that develop like cancer, so you know, cancer cachexia or cancer wasting is, um, is something that I think even the general public you know, is, kind of, is, is aware of. It's really tragic. Um, you know, people become sometimes unrecognizable. You know, they get a, a cancer diagnosis and a year later, uh, not only from the metabolic effects of the cancer, but the chemo and the poor nutrition that goes with it, you know, it's not uncommon for them to drop like 60, 70 pounds of, uh, and become really weak just from muscle tissue loss. So the normal rate of muscle loss, this is a good graph here. So generally, even if you have a really bad lifestyle and you, you don't consume enough quality protein and you don't do resistance exercise, in your 20s, you tend to hold on to most of your muscle tissue. But after age 30, it's about, so every 10 years, you're looking at like three to 8% of your total muscle tissue is gone. And, and you're not gonna get it back unless you do something about it. So there's this inevitable, just little three to 8% drop. But something happens around, you know, as you approach age 60, that, that curve, as you can see there, it starts to dip down. And again, it's it, it this, it's multifactorial. There's a lot going on here, um, and you know we'll talk about that. But but th this is a real phenomenon, and this is why I really harp on guys. You know, if 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 you work with me, um, and you're under the age of 50, one of our primary goals is to slap as much muscle tissue on you as possible before you get into your 50s. And obviously, you know, I want to change your body composition. We're going to address visceral body fat, all of that stuff. I'm not saying it's, it, it, no, that is also like critically important, but you have an opportunity in your younger years and you guys in your 20s, you know, it, you, you're never going to build muscle tissue with resistance exercise like you do in your teens and 20s. So if you're not getting in the gym, you know, for God's sakes, please get in there. And I'm not saying you have to be a bodybuilder. Okay, I'm not saying, I'm definitely not saying you should take testosterone or anabolic steroids as a young man, you know, to get that. But getting in the gym regularly, build those healthy habits. And, you know, if you could put on 20 pounds of muscle tissue, you know, if you're in your 20s and you put on 20 pounds of muscle tissue, which, um, you know, it doesn't seem like a lot, but that is a lot of muscle tissue. If you can do that by the time you, you, you get to be about age 50, like you've done yourself a major service because you now you have this surplus of muscle tissue and it will it will serve you well after the age of 50 when this curve starts to go and you start losing some of that muscle tissue it's um it's it's going to help you out okay now if you're over the age of, of 50 or 60 you know it it, it clearly like it's it, it it's not over <laughs> if you're over the age of 50 or 60 it's still I'm still going to emphasize putting muscle tissue on and, and strength. Just keep in mind, it's going to be harder, especially if you've never done any kind of resistance training before and you know, you're know you a 55-year-old man with a beer belly. Listen, it's going to be hard, but it, it is possible and you're never too old to benefit from lifting weights. You know The, the studies even in, in 80 and 90-year-olds are, are crystal clear. They benefit greatly from uh, resistance training. So it's never too late. It's just that there are windows of opportunity that you really should try to take advantage of. And they all are generally before the age of 50. All right.
Okay, so what happens with muscle tissue as you get older? So this is a good little chart that shows there's a lot going on here. So, uh, and, you know, we'll touch on all of these a little bit. Nutritional status. Typically, as you get older, uh, especially elderly people that uh, live alone in many cases, they, um, their nutritional status gets poor. They, they need more protein than they did in their younger years, but inevitably they end up eating less. And I, and I see this all the time. There is obviously a decline in hormones in both men and women. You know, my, my practice is centered for men. So there is an issue, there are issues with testosterone that contribute to this. Clearly genetics, you know, have a, have a role here. Um, muscle innervation, this is really interesting. So, you know, the number of motor units that you have starts to go down. The ability to uh, rapidly conduct signals and rapidly contract your muscles uh, starts to go down and the nervous system plays a huge role in that chronic inflammation also a big one I mentioned that with you know sarcopenic obesity, which is obesity related to um, or it, it's sarcopenia in the setting of morbid obesity you know we think of sarcopenia as being like you're, you're skinny with tiny muscles well sarcopenic obesity is your muscles are skinny but you you are not skinny and I see this all the time when I put people through cat scanners there's this huge blob of fat and inside is a tiny little person you know and and if you look at the the muscles as as you go through the slices on the CT scan and you look at like the psoas muscle the obliques there are these thin wispy you know, low quality muscles, they're infiltrated with fat. And, um, and, and, you know, that, that is a direct result, not only of the aging process, but this um, issue with sarcopenic obesity, oxidative stress goes along with that. There are issues with blood flow, both with uh, endothelial dysfunction in the small vessels, but all, the, but also going all the way back to the heart. You know, if you have congestive heart failure, clearly you're not uh, perfusing your organs as, as well as you would if you didn't have that exercise and activity. This is a huge one. Um, you know, many elderly people, um, you know, whether it's from osteoarthritis, whether it's from, um, you know, for, for, for whatever, you know, other chronic medical issues, whatever the case may be, their exercise activity goes way down. And, you know, it, it really is a case of use it or lose it. And they are losing it because of uh, not only all these other issues, but they're just not ex exercising. And then we mentioned chronic disease, you know, obviously like cancer, cachexia, type 2 diabetes, chronic kidney disease, all that kind of stuff contributes. It's, uh, it is a major, major problem. Now, I'm going to focus on muscle mass and muscle tissue uh, strength in this little talk here, but keep in mind, you know, VO2 max, which is your, your body's ability to maximally use oxygen during, you know, intense exercise, th that's going to go down too. And um, if you listen to any of Peter Atia's stuff, you know, he, he's absolutely spot on when he says that, um, you know, a major predictor of lifespan and uh, mortality is your VO2 max. So you have to fight tooth and nail to, to keep your VO2 max from declining as much as it normally would if you're sedentary. And you have to work just as hard with, at that as you do with your, uh, with your weight training, you know, to keep your muscle tissue up. So I'm not gonna get into, you know, the ways to do that. I'll probably do another talk on that, but, you know, uh, high intensity sprint interval, interval training on a bike or a climber um, is, gonna, is gonna help you out a lot with that. It's super, super important. And I'll be totally honest, I'm not as good about doing that as I probably should be. Um, yeah, but I'm going to go get a VO2 max test here done shortly and uh, maybe I'll share those results with you guys. Okay. So one of the things that happens with old people is they get sick. And, and again, I see this all the time in the emergency department. They come in and they are in the hospital for maybe two or three days, uh, maybe a week, sometimes two weeks, just kind of depends. They're largely immobile. Okay. And when you lay there in a bed, your muscle tissue just wastes away. It just wastes away. And that happens when you're young. I mean, I think all of us have probably had the experience of like having a cast on your arm and you take your cast off in, in uh, you know, eight weeks and you've got this spindly little like chicken arm, you know, and you're like, God damn it. But, um, you know, it, it comes back, right? I remember I had a distal radius fracture when I was, I don't know, I was probably like eight years old and I had this, I was, I was horrified at my skinny little forearm. But within, I mean, I don't remember the exact time frame, but honestly, within like two months, it was right back. It looked exactly like my other arm. It bounced back immediately. Well, when you're an elderly person, not only um, do you lose a lot more muscle tissue. So there's studies on this, uh, and, and they, they mentioned those in those articles that like, if you put an elderly person 
on bed rest for two weeks, you can expect about a 30% loss in muscle um, in muscle mass in, in some cases. And especially if they're critically ill and they have like high metabolic demands. And if there's one thing that we're terrible about doing uh, for patients in the hospital, especially in the ICU, is feeding them. You know, we don't give them enough enough nutritional support to help them get through, you know, whatever issue it is that they have. But, you know, if you take a younger person and do that, you know, someone who's like 19 or 20, well, they might lose like 2 to 5%, and then they very rapidly get that back. Well, these elderly people, they do not get it back. They don't get it back to anywhere near the extent. They, they almost never... Um, in fact, I've never seen I've never seen them return to baseline, and that's what lands them in these nursing homes and um, in these rehab centers. Is they're just they're whatever medical issue brought them into the hospital, um, pneumonia, a kidney infection, you know, whatever the case may be, um, that gets cleared up and they're all better. But they can't go home, and they can't go home because they can't they literally can't get out of bed to walk to the bathroom, which is like a basic you know, activity of daily living, you've got to be able to do it safely. And they can't, or, or if they can, they're too weak and unsteady, like they're at high risk for a fall. So we send them home, you know, we don't want them to fall down and like have a hip fracture. Uh, so they end up in a rehab facility and those are terrible. You, know, you don't want to go there. So this is a good chart here, just showing some of the many changes that happen. And there's two different pathways. You can go down the unhealthy pathway or the healthy pathway. Um, some of the, you know, these changes, again, a lot of these are inevitable but that doesn't mean that they're not modifiable, okay? So, you know, we have, you know, you lose muscle tissue, uh, and specifically, you, like, the number of muscle cells that you have is less, the number of satellite cells which merge into uh, your muscle tissue or your, your active muscle cells to help with, you know, hypertrophy and things like that, those go way down. Muscle twitch time, so I was talking about your, you know, your motor units and your nervous system, your twitch time goes down. Um, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which stores calcium, super important. You have to release calcium and you have to do it quickly in, in, in sufficient quantities to have a good, strong muscle contraction. Well, the volume of the sarcoplasmic reticulum goes down. So you're releasing less calcium and, you know, and of course you have a less uh, powerful contraction. Um, fat infiltration into, in and around the muscle tissue, which is directly toxic to the uh, the myocytes themselves. I kind of touched on that before with the sarcopenic obesity. That's a big thing. I see it all the time on, on CAT scans. It's, um, it's, it's actually kind of frightening um, what happens with that. So again, we talked about aggravating factors. Um, the hormones are, are a big one. Uh, you know, we're going to focus on testosterone in men, but you know, w women obviously have pretty serious hormonal changes. There are drops in IGF-1, and uh, you know, obviously, which is related to growth hormone. Poor physical activity, poor nutrition, especially in the area of protein intake. Development of chronic inflammatory disease, visceral body fat. This is like the toxic soup. That's it's just a setup for muscle tissue loss and poor quality of life. So, speaking of poor quality of life, okay. So th this is a really great little slide here that comes from that article. So down here in the red, this is what you, you clearly you don't want to be in the red. You don't want to be in the yellow either. Um, this is disability loss of independence. So so this is somebody that requires full time care, uh, usually in a nursing home. They they cannot take care of themselves. Maybe they've had a stroke. You know they literally they they are in a diaper. In many cases they can't feed themselves. This is a horrible place to end up, and sadly. There's a lot of people that spend quite literally like the last 10 years of their life in this miserable uh, state where they have total loss of independence. And it's, it's like the quality of life for them is, is horrible. But the one above it is not a heck of a lot better. Now, sometimes these, these frail elderly sarcopenic people in the yellow group, they can just get by. They can do their ADLs, you know, they can cook for themselves. They can, um, you know, get up and use the bathroom. You know, if they wanted to go on a hike with their grandkids, that's out of the question. Okay, that is not going to happen. Um, you know, anything anything more physically demanding than just the basics of like getting up and down from the couch, cooking a meal for yourself, you know, that kind of stuff. Anything more than that is is probably not going to happen for them. And then in the green, you know, you want to be as high as you can, obviously, in the green. So let's focus on this gray this gray line here. So this is what I see every day. This is the typical American. This is this is the typical American, and you know they they are doing everything wrong. So uh, in many cases they are coming out of the womb obese. So you know they're obese toddlers, and you know they eat nothing but junk food. They don't exercise. They play video games. 
and you know not surprisingly that curve it, the inflection is way down so they're they're on a straight shot right down and they make it to a certain point here and then they suffer some kind of a medical catastrophe like i was alluding to before i don't know it could be anything let's just say it's uh you know they get a bad COVID infection they end up in the hospital for two weeks well boom they they take they plunge down into the yellow zone and then you know through the miracle of modern medicine we save their life and we help them get out of the yellow zone into the green but man they are nowhere near where they used to be but you know at least they're in the green zone right but here's the thing the aging process continues their bad habits continue they continue losing muscle tissue gaining fat um, not doing what they're supposed to be doing and then inevitably they end up down here into this yellow zone they have another medical catastrophe now we have to work even harder to get them back but they they're, they're not getting back in the green zone they're done they're done and then they're gonna tool along here in the yellow zone for you know who knows how long until the next catastrophe comes along whatever the case may be usually an infection maybe a fall and then at that point they're done they're down in the red zone they're not coming out and it is a straight shot down and you know when, when that curve hits the bottom there that's death okay so uh the green line is is somebody who's really doing a good job so that you know th this is the person who you know uh maybe grew up in a family that uh you know emphasized good nutrition and exercise like i did and uh, they do not allow themselves to become obese. They stay relatively lean. They engage in a lot of physical activity. It doesn't have to necessarily be weight training, but you know they're out, they're doing stuff. They're engaged socially. That's really important for older people. So they've got a, a really supportive family and a social circle. So they, they get to stay in the green zone for a long time and they can weather these little catastrophes that come along and still bounce back. You know, w when they get pneumonia, they get to go home when their pneumonia is done they still got some reserve and, and they do okay but you know inevitably aging is aging and they, and they go down to and eventually they're going to end up down in this yellow zone here now this not so straight blue line that i tried to draw it's hard to draw a straight line with a mouse i'm not that savvy with photoshop but um, i know you can do it i just i'm just not good at it um you know this is somebody who we can say at an early age really took this healthy aging thing to heart and it had a you know not just a good diet but a really like top five percent diet this is somebody who is hitting the gym regularly engaged in sports has all the you know obviously the good social circle and all, all that they're basically they're doing everything perfectly well their curve stays really flat for a really long time and they can handle anything that comes along for the most part and then inevitably you know all of us nobody gets out of here alive right even if you do everything perfectly eventually they're going to drop off that curve and uh, but you know but they they typically live longer and they live a full rich high quality life okay so um, let's look at so these I, I put in these little blue arrows for you guys so early on let, let, let's say this blue arrow this is like your 19 year old you know college student okay typical American college student the, the difference between the blue, green, and the gray line here, it's not as, it's not that big. You know, when, when you're 19, even if you're obese and totally unhealthy with your lifestyle, I mean, you're still 19, right? You're gonna do, you're gonna do okay if you get pneumonia. You're gonna do, generally, you're gonna do okay. Now, you're not gonna do as okay as some of these other people, but, uh, you know, like, you'll, you'll be okay. But now, like, let's move down to this next one. So this is, let's say this is about 50. So this is a picture here. This is the typical 50 year old, quite honestly, that I see. And I'm 50 years old. So that's my counterpart, okay? I see, I see, I'm not joking. I see five to 10 of this, these guys every single day. Like they could be clones of this guy. All right, morbidly obese. If he's not a full-blown type two diabetic, he's well on his way. But this is the typical 50 year old that I see, okay? And again, this is the guy that's on that downward trajectory. He's the guy that gets really sick and ends up in the hospital on a ventilator with COVID for two weeks. And then he gets bumped down into this yellow zone, you know, at, at the age of 50. Okay. Um, I, I did a two hour jujitsu class today and I rolled for, I did six rounds for uh, six minutes long. Th this guy would have a heart attack if he did that. Now let's move out to this, you know, you can see as you get older, like these, these arrows, the difference between the, the age management person or even the successful aging person and the gray line here 
is the, now the difference is really striking, right? So, so th that's this guy. This is this obese elderly guy who uh, is probably living in a nursing home or like at the very least he's probably living in like an assisted care facility because he can still do a lot of stuff on his own but he just needs a little bit of help but you know what's his quality of life like you know do you, do you think he's out with his grandkids do you think he's going riding his bike do you think, do you think he's having sex with his wife I don't know probably not probably not okay I want to contrast that with a picture of this guy here this is John Turner. Uh, I think this picture was taken in the mid '80s. Now I don't know who John Turner was is, but I've I've seen his photo pop up in multiple medical lectures. Um, I, I got this picture. This is from the book, uh, which is you can find on Amazon. It's called "Growing Old Is Not for Sissies," which is a great name for a book. There's part one and part two. It was uh, it's from Pom Pomegranate Art Books, 1995. Well, this is John Turner at age 67. Okay. Guy looks phenomenal. Okay, this is like he's in the on the blue line. I don't know what his protocol was and his his program, but clearly, he's doing everything right at age sixty seven. The striking thing is, you know, look at him at age seventy nine. Now, has John lost a little bit of muscle tissue? Maybe you, know, you can see maybe in his in his pecs and his delts, his biceps not not quite as jacked. But damn close, right? So this is a perfect example that if, if you do everything correctly, you you do not have to lose the, the kind of muscle tissue that we're talking about with the average American. And, you know, he looks amazing. He looks, I don't know anything about his medical history. I don't know anything about him. But just looking at this guy, you know, I, I bet he can run circles around most modern 20-year-olds. You know, at the gym, uh, on the bike, you know, whatever the case may be, and um, and and this this is, I've said this before in other talks, this is normal. Okay, what what we got going on in society today is not normal. What is average is not normal, and I don't want to go too far down that because I'll start going on a rant. Um, but really, for a large portion, like probably 99% of the time humans have been on the, on the planet, you can look at pictures of old, uh, like, Aboriginal Bushmen in the uh, early 1900s, you know, um, the, these few groups out there that still uh, follow hunter-gatherer lifestyles. And, and you look at the elders in the village, they don't look that much different than John Turner. They really don't. Um, so that... This should be the standard, in my opinion. What, what I showed you in those other pictures is so grossly distorted and so grossly abnormal that it's obscene. But that is now the norm, or the, that is the average, I should say. Uh, it should not be the norm. What are you gonna do so you end up more like, I'm not saying you have to be like John Turner, but what, what are you gonna do? You have to come up with a plan. There's some basic things that you can do, and we'll start with, we'll start with nutrition first. Protein is critically important as you get older. Uh, to hold on to your muscle tissue. Um, inevitably, older people, on average, if you look at the, uh, the studies that look at this, the demographic studies and population studies, they inevitably eat less protein than they did when they were younger. Whereas, um, what, they, their body, what their body needs is actually quite a bit more protein. Uh, there's this phenomenon called anabolic resistance, which I'll touch on just briefly, but um, it's, uh, it is critically important to up your protein intake as you get older, particularly over the age of 65, not to decrease your protein intake, okay? Now, with the caveat that, you know, if you have stage four kidney disease, you know, eat as much protein as your nephrologist tells you to do. Do what your nephrologist says. But if you have otherwise, if you otherwise have normal renal function, um, there's, no, there's no damage, like that is a myth. You're, you're not gonna hurt your kidneys by upping your protein intake. You will only benefit from that, okay? So this is an article here that's really good. Journals of, uh, Gerontology, it is uh, from 2015. Protein ingestion to stimulate myofibrillar protein synthesis requires greater relative protein intakes in healthy versus older men. So this gets to this issue of, um, of um, anabolic resistance. After a protein meal, it's natural to have a spike, especially if you have a, a good amount of leucine, um, and we'll talk about uh, some glycine as well, in that meal, you're gonna have a, a spike in muscle protein synthesis. That's, you, your muscles are like, they, they take that substrate in and they start, they start making muscle protein. 
That happens when you're 20, it happens when you're 80. But it takes a lot more protein at 80 to get the same amount of muscle protein synthesis that you did at 20. Significantly more, okay? So that's, that's, that's what we're talking about when, it's one of the, the facets of, of anabolic resistance in the elderly it, uh, it, as related to protein intake. So the, you know, the institutes of medicine and, and most doctors, quite honestly, uh, recommend 0 0.8 grams per kilo per day, which is woefully inadequate, okay, for anybody. Uh, unless you're just a complete couch potato, okay? And even, even at that, um, according to this document here, I mean, 38% of adult men don't even get that much protein, which is kind of hard to believe. So how much should you eat as you get older? Well, that's a great question. So um, weight training athletes um, probably max out their muscle protein synthesis at about 2.2 grams per kilo. Uh, which ends up being, you know, a gram per pound. So it turns out the bodybuilding magazines were probably right. Now this is for not the elder, not an elderly weight training athlete. This is just general recommendations. And for my patients, most of whom are not elderly, that's about what I recommend. I was like, if you go above 2.2 grams per kilo, you're probably not going to get much additional benefit from that. It's not that you can't. Um, but you're probably not going to get much additional benefit in terms of muscle protein synthesis. I know there's there's a little bit of quibbling on that, um, depending on who you talk to. But the thing is, like, if you're in a calorie deficit, this is just a, as an aside, and you you know, let's say you're you're really trying to lose body fat, you know, again, it's critical that you hold on to as much muscle tissue as you possibly can, and you can do that. You actually need more protein at that point. So at that point, we're going up to like 2.3 to maybe 3.1 grams uh, per kilo um, of fat-free mass. So that's a lot more than 2.2, okay? So these recommendations come from the International Society of Sports Nutrition. Uh, they have a consensus statement on protein intake, and you guys can go uh, look that up if you, if you want to. Um, they recommend uh, three to five grams of leucine as, you know, whenever you have a protein meal, just make sure that uh, three to five grams of that at least are from leucine. That's really, I mean, you don't have to worry about that. If you just have a steak, if you drink a whey protein shake, you know, anything like that, anything that has a lot of high quality, certainly like any animal protein will cover you. If you're a vegan, now you gotta be a little bit more, uh, a little bit more clever, maybe a little bit more conscientious of um, making sure that you get those three to five grams of leucine. So I'm not saying you can't do it, totally can be done. You just have to be uh, maybe a little bit more conscientious of uh, your protein sources. Because uh, unfortunately, a lot of plant protein is low in leucine. Uh, hemp protein is actually pretty decent. I use hemp protein. So if you're a vegan, try a little hemp protein. And then I'm a big fan of uh, HMB. So HMB is a metabolite of leucine. Uh, let's see if I can pronounce it. Beta-hydroxymethylbutyrate. <laughs> it has some pretty uh, well-documented anti-catabolic effects, especially in older people. So if you're in a calorie deficit, consider adding five grams of HMB into your daily, uh, as part of your daily protein intake. Um, I, I think they should be putting HMB in all of those like geriatric boost, those horrible geriatric boost shakes that they make people drink at the hospital, which are garbage. Um, you know, they, they would be so much better if they would at least spike them with either some leucine or some HMB. Okay, so that's protein. Uh, now let's talk about exercise. This is super important. So these are two papers that I'm going to use uh, as the, uh, the sources for this information I'm going to give you. Okay, this is the effect, first one, effects of exercise and aging on skeletal muscle. Also really like solid review. This is in uh, the 2018 edition of Cold Springs Harbor uh, Laboratory Press. And um, it's really, really good. Uh, this is another really excellent one that uh, I'm going to show you a really cool MRI picture that came from this one. So this is a chronic exercise preserves lean muscle mass in masters athletes. And specifically, they were looking at triathletes. This comes from the Physician and Sports Medicine, which is awesome. It's a totally awesome journal. I've been reading this one since I was in medical school. Uh, it's, it's a little bit older, 2011, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a good one. It's a good one. So, okay. So this is the picture that I want to show you guys. And this is another one that like makes the rounds in, in the world of medicine. Like in, um, you know, whenever there's a talk about sarcopenia or something like that, like this, this, this picture keeps showing up. So I've seen this like many times over the years, but it's, it's really profound. So they looked at a whole group of masters triathletes, uh, ages like 40 to, uh, I think 40 to 81 in this study. And, and this is an MRI, it's a cross section. 
So, um, and you know, you can see similar pictures on a CT scan, but the, they used an MRI. So th these are the quads of a 40 year old triathlete. In the middle here, that white dot, that's their femur. So what do you see here? You see a lot of good, really healthy looking muscle tissue, a tiny amount of subcutaneous fat around there. You don't see a ton of fatty infiltration at all. Uh, this, this is like high quality muscle, right? Looks good, which you'd expect in a 40 year old triathlete. Well, what does a 74 year old couch potato look like? Wow, major difference, right? Look at this, it's, it's, all of this white stuff is fat. This is all fat. Okay, and not only do they have an excess amount of fat, you can see it infiltrating into the muscle tissue itself. You can see it just kind of burying itself, like working its way through there. And look at the, I mean, you can just tell the quality of the muscle tissue is really compromised in this guy. This is, this is not good. Uh, and again, this is what I see every single day. Every time I throw an elderly person in a CAT scanner, uh, this is what I see. And honestly, these days, uh, this is when I throw a 45-year-old in a CAT scanner, this is sometimes what I see. But the take-home message here is this bottom one, okay? This is a 70-year-old triathlete. You know, and if I didn't tell you that, you'd be like, that looks just like the 40-year-old triathlete, and it's because it does. So, you know, an active 70-year-old triathlete um, can maintain muscle tissue. And that's exactly what that study, the study that I, the one I cited to you earlier, it's exactly what this showed. So yeah, they looked at 40 to 81 year old athletes. They measured quadricep strength. They looked at the volume, you know, on a CT scan. And it was really interesting. There was not a huge difference in quad strength uh, in these athletes from the 40 year olds right up until about the 60 year olds. So the 40, 50, up to 59 year olds all had roughly the same amount of muscle volume and the same amount of quad strength. So pretty impressive. There was a little dip at 60, which you know goes along with the chart that I showed you previously, but the difference between the 60, 70, and even the 80 year olds was not statistically significant. So yeah, there is that inevitable dip that I mentioned, but it doesn't, it's not like they just continue to plummet after age 60, at least according you know, to this article, which I'll show you this little chart here, which kind of goes along with that. There, there was not a huge difference that was statistically significant anyway between the 60, 70, and 80 year old groups in here. And you can see that here. Um, this, this is both, you know, they looked at both men and women actually. So if you look at, you know, 40 to 59, they're kind of a little bit more clustered in the like upper left quadrant there. And then, you know, the 60 through 70 plus, you know, all the way to 80 is clustered a little bit kind of in the bottom right there. Um, but again, not, not huge differences, right? PT is, t is peak torque, okay? So it's a measure of, you know, essentially how strong their, their quads were. Not a, I mean, there's a drop off there, but it's, you know, the, the, this older group is, they're, they're doing pretty well for themselves. Okay, so we talked about protein, we talked about exercise. If you just do those two, you're gonna be so far ahead of the average American. Like, you, you will be on that green curve that I showed you earlier. Um, the, the way to get up to that blue curve in many cases is to start paying attention to hormonal changes and maybe some of these other molecules that are in the pipeline we'll talk about briefly, okay? But maintaining a healthy level of testosterone, any of you guys have watched this content uh, and, and you, you should be aware of that. Uh, as you get older, this is something that you should probably keep an eye on. Now, the, the good news is, is that if you do everything that you're supposed to do in the nutrition and exercise department, you can maintain a solidly um, healthy, normal, robust testosterone level way up into your 60s. I, I've seen it on a number of occasions, but um, you know there may be other medical issues. There may be other things that you know compromise that. So it's something you just need to be aware of. Sometimes your t your total testosterone level won't really change that much as you get older, but as part of the natural aging process, your SHBG, steroid hormone binding globulin, which binds up the vast majority of your testosterone, that naturally rises, okay? So you'll get a, a drop in the free testosterone level, which does correlate pretty well with symptoms. So just make sure that, uh, you know, if you're an older guy, well, if you're anybody for the most part, but if you're an older guy especially, um, and you want to go get your testosterone checked by your doctor, just make sure that they do a total and a free. If you just want it, that way you have a complete picture of what's going on because every now and then you can get fooled by that. I know that's not generally in the guidelines, but uh, if you really want to know what's going on with your testosterone, you got to get a free 
Um, and I know all of you guys that watch my content, you should know that by now. I'm not gonna dive into this, but there's also down the pipeline, there's a lot of research in the area of sarcopenia that just hasn't um, hit the mainstream yet. So there's, look, there's a lot of, because this is such a critical, this is a major, major issue in this country and worldwide the, you know, with the aging population. It's, uh, you know, it is a massive financial drain on the, um, on the medical system. So, you know, there, there are pharmaceutical companies and, uh, you know, university researchers out there looking at ways uh, and they're trying to discover these you know alternative anabolic agents things other than testosterone to see if we can make a difference in people things like folistatin and I'm not going to get into that but uh, kind of interesting okay real briefly I want to touch on th there's a few things that are a little bit fringe I'll admit but uh, you know have some reasonable data and um, they are uh, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers which are standard you know they're very commonly used uh, blood pressure medicines been around for decades extremely safe uh, they're generally first line for many people but it turns out that they actually might have some beneficial effects in our quest to not only build muscle tissue but to hold on to it as you get older and here's two articles that talk about this this is um, Science of Translational Medicine, 2011. Losartan, which is an ARB, uh, restores skeletal muscle remodeling and protects against disuse atrophy in sarcopenia. Again, animal study uh, showed some benefit with sarcopenia. This is the uh, Journal of Physical Therapy Sciences, um, angiotensin II receptor blockade, uh, muscle strength and exercise capacity in physically independent older adults. So this one actually looked at, at humans, okay? So this is what they showed here briefly. I'll just, here's a little chart here. So they had these, these, these people who were either in a control group, either on an ACE inhibitor or on an ARB, and they had, they just, they did things very simply. They, they measured grip strength, and then they measured a six minute walk test, which is like you get up and you just go, and we'll just see how far grandma can go in six minutes, okay? And as you can see here, both the ACE inhibitor group and the ARB group like significantly outperformed the control group. And they did a reasonably good job at like getting a good control group, you know? There's always confounders with stuff like this. Um, in this particular case, the ACE inhibitor group actually did a little bit better than the ARB group. Uh, it's not, it was statistically significant, but not by a wide margin. So um, I, I don't know which is better. I, I think we need to kind of wait and see, but um, I think that these are both viable options, either an ACE inhibitor or an, uh, an ARB, if you want to consider using it, you know, as an off-label indication. Now, a, a, lot of, a lot of people develop hypertension anyway as they get older. Um, and so to keep, you know, keep somebody in an optimal blood pressure range, which is probably under 120 over 80, you know, a lot of times you may end up on a low dose of one of these drugs anyway, so maybe you'll get the added benefit. Um, I, you know, I don't have a strong feelings one way or the other about, you know, one drug over the other, but Telmosartan, I do, I do kind of tend to prescribe that perhaps a bit more. It's very common and in, in popular in the bodybuilding community. It has the longest half-life of any ARB, and uh, without getting into too many details, I have another video on it if you want to go into the details, but you know, it stimulates this um, PPAR gamma receptor, which is unique in ARBs, and so uh, you know, it may have anti-atherosclerotic properties, it may have uh, you know, uh, anti-lipolysis or anti-obesity effects, there's some speculation that it may be actually a performance enhancing drug. So uh, I know that the IOC is looking at it. I don't think it's been banned yet, but uh, I'm, I'm willing to bet that there's probably some athletes out there that are spiking themselves with Telmosartan. So anyway, something to think about. Rapamycin as well is, is something that I think has a future. Uh, I'm very interested in rapamycin. I started taking it a year ago. It, th this is the gold standard for geroprotective medications in, in the research literature. There's, there's like really robust animal data on this and we're getting better human data. Um, this is the two articles I want to quote to you here. This is a rapamycin dose. Doses sufficient to extend lifespan do not compromise muscle mitochondrial content or endurance. This is from the journal Aging 2009 because that was a big concern is that you know if you're inhibiting mTOR now you're going to inhibit um, you're going to inhibit uh, muscle protein syn synthesis. You're going to harm the mitochondria. It's going to be bad for muscles, right? Well, here's another article. This one's a little bit newer, also in aging, but this one's from 2009. That seems to show that that's not the case, at least in in laboratory animals. We do know that as you get older, your mTOR levels start to rise, and they don't. This is not a beneficial thing. 
okay? This actually causes damage to muscles. So uh, it's a bit counterintuitive. Like you would think an mTOR inhibitor would inhibit muscle growth, muscle strength, you know, the quality of your muscle tissue. Uh, from what we can see so far, that's probably not the case. Unless you take it, like you don't want to take it right after a workout because it does seem to blunt that response. So you'd want to space it out maybe a day or two after your workout. And then it, does, it actually seems to show benefit in that area. So a lot more needs to be figured out with rapamycin in that regard. But at least we have, a, we have some decent signal here that this is not deleterious to your muscle tissue. Um, I'm hoping we'll have a lot more uh, information in that area like in the next four or five years. All right guys, just to wrap things up, listen, um, you gotta have a plan. You gotta have a plan for how you're gonna age. And a, and a huge part of that is gonna center around when you're younger, like ideally, you know, under the age of 50, you're gonna really focus on putting on a, a substantial amount of quality, healthy muscle tissue. You're gonna do it in a healthy way, okay? And then as you transition past the age of 50, uh, especially when you get into your 60s, you're gonna have to not only continue what you were doing before, you're probably gonna have to double down uh, increase your protein intake and you're gonna have to fight tooth and nail to hold on to all of that muscle tissue that you work so hard to get it doesn't get easier as you get older guys it's just how it is but it's totally worth it because again on that that chart I showed you you want to stay out of that yellow and red zone you want to stay up in the green zone where you're doing everything that um, everything that you want to do you know and enjoying life in your 70s 80s and into your 90s so to wrap it up nutrition's got to be good make sure you have good high quality protein minimum 2.2 grams per kilo if you're in a calorie deficit it's probably going to need to be higher uh, if you're an elderly person above the age of 65 it may also need to be higher you've um, you've got to lift weights i mean i i don't it, it's not optional in my opinion if uh if, if you want to if you want to have a healthy long functional life some kind of resistance training you don't have to do hardcore high intensity you know bodybuilding training like i've done or competitive powerlifting but you've got to get in the gym uh well either a commercial gym or you know you can do it at home but you you've got to you've got to move the iron it's um i in my in my program it's uh non-negotiable like it's if you don't want to lift weights then i'm i'm not the doctor for you <laughs> okay and then keep tabs on your hormones if you get to a place where uh, you and your doctor think that, you know, starting testosterone therapy, uh, whatever the case may be, uh, is in your best interest, then, yeah, by all means, you know, do that. Uh, it, it will probably pay dividends for you uh, down the road. And as I mentioned, there are some really interesting, this whole field of like geroprotective agents, things like rapamycin, maybe ACE inhibitors, ARBs. Uh, there are a ton of other ones out there that have some evidence and that are in the in the in the pipeline that uh, you know maybe they have the potential to revolutionize this field. So uh, we'll just have to see. Okay, guys, that's all I have for you. I'd love to hear what you think about this. Uh, if you're one of my listeners and you're in your early 20s, uh, get on this. Like the earlier you start this, the better. If you're one of my listeners in your 60s, then you really need to get on this. It's not too late um, to make those kind of changes. If there's anything I can help you with, you'll just, you can reach out to me. I'm happy to do that. I do consults all the time, um, and uh, I'm always always eager to hear from you guys. So have a good one. Have a good weekend. I'm closing things down. I'm going to the emergency room. i got to work a shift. All right. Bye, guys. All Man Medicine video and audio has been created and shared online for informational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute the practice of medicine or professional healthcare services of any kind, including the giving of medical advice. I am not your doctor. No doctor-patient relationship has been established. This content is not meant to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied upon solely for that purpose either. The only purpose of this content is to present peer-reviewed, research-backed health information for your consideration. As always, rely on the advice and guidance of your personal physician before undertaking any activity presented here, and if in doubt or not comfortable with said activity, practice discretion. Your health is your responsibility and not ours. Finally, I take conflicts of interest seriously. I accept no compensation whatsoever from any private corporations, including pharmaceutical or supplement companies. You can trust that if I recommend a medication, product, or service, it's because I genuinely believe in it and not because I'm being paid to endorse it.